Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So today, Bhagavatam is addressing one of the most difficult theological questions that the human mind has ever had to ponder. And this is not just a philosophical question. It is a question that is close to the experience of every one of us. And that question, we could phrase it as, where is God amid the world's suffering? Or we could put it more than, where is God amid our distresses, our suffering? So that, what is his role? Oh, why does he not intervene? Is he intervening and I'm not perceiving? What, what is happening? So we'll try to discuss this topic today. And I'll talk about it in three broad parts. So the first point, which is emphasized in this verse, we can phrase it as, Krishna is the cause of all causes, but not the cause of all effects. Krishna is the cause of all causes. Sarva karana karana. Everything that has causal potency, everything that has the capacity to cause something to happen, that capacity comes from Krishna. In the sense that he, in that sense, he is the cause of all causes. However, he is not the cause of all effects. The example given the Vidhan Sutra is that the rain is the cause of all vegetation that grows on the earth. But the rain is not the cause of the specific vegetation that grows in specific places. Weeds may go at one place and the crops may grow at some place. That depends on what is being sown in the ground. But this implies that in this world, when distresses come upon us, it is, it is not a very straightforward analysis that, okay, that why is God doing this to me? Sometimes people ask, why is God doing this to me? Why did God give me this cancer? Why did God, God cause me to lose a loved one? Why did God cause me to lose my job? Mm -hmm. When Sometimes some question itself is wrong. What that means is that the, in one sense, the questioning spirit, the inquisitive spirit is good. But the way some questions are framed, that may not be the best way to get answers. So we can sometimes, no question is bad. Okay, you may say like that. No question is bad, except the question that leaves no door open for good answers. That means, say if somebody is, remember one, one young boy had come to me three months. And he just, uh, he told me about him. He faced a lot of problems. His mother had passed away when he was born and then his father passed away in an accident when he was going to pick him up from school and then he was living with some relatives. And then they face a lot of problems. And then he had been handed over to uh, multiple people. And then he asked me, he says, am I bad or am I bad luck? Mm -hmm. So now it, it is a very terrible state to be in where the only question is, you know, am I bad luck or am I just bad? So because of me, all these bad things are happening to others. So now this is a bad question. Because it does not leave any option for a good answer. Are you somebody angry with someone? Are you stupid or are you evil? <laughs> <laughs> you are not leaving any other option itself. So sometimes the way we phrase a question can limit the range of answers over there. So instead of asking, why is God causing this in my life? We need to ask a more fundamental question. Is God really the cause of these things in my life? So the way we phrase our questions determines how much understanding we can get. 
and sometimes we may not even be conscious of the question that is filling our consciousness shila prabhupad writes the first canto part four and the whole universe is filled with question and answers so sometimes you know people say i don't have any questions that's fine we may not have any articulated or articulable questions but we can say whatever we are interested in so suddenly we hear some noise behind let me look behind that means we have a question what happened over there so there may not be an articulated question but the question is always there and sometimes we may not be aware of what question is driving us so if we are asking the wrong question in the sense that that the question is phrased in such a way that it presumes certain answers so why is god causing this why is god doing this well the relationship of krishna with the world is complex and to say that our so when i said krishna is not the cause of all effects is the cause of all causes what that means is that we have free will and we have the capacity to exercise our free will but the extent of our capacity is determined by our past karma if i get angry i may just yell at some people if the uh, if the president of russia gets angry he can throw nuclear discharge nuclear weapon or something is it so the amount of destruction that we can cause depends on the our past karma which is determined our present capacity and this our capacities come from krishna as a soul i can't control my karma but by my past karma krishna gives me a certain amount of capacity to control my karma that is called my kshetra so so a dis, uh, a tyrant's capacity to do evil comes from krishna but the tyrant's evil actions don't come from krishna and the difference is clear that the capacity to do something so like a contemporary example of like this like you know if a weapon of mass destruction is made the weapons of mass destruction are made by scientists but mass destruction is not caused by scientists mass destruction is caused by politics political leaders or whoever are using those weapons so we could say that without those scientists that destruction would not happen that's true but that does not mean the scientists cause the destruction people are saying this you can't blame the science for the misuse of science people are very assertive about that but then we turn the same thing to religion no you know we can't this the the science can't be held responsible for its misuse and the religion also can't be held responsible for its misuse but that you know our religion is a true system and it just it's not it's just the our biases that shape how we look at things but the point is that the our own capacity also to do bad things but we all may have desires that we may not be proud of but not all of us have the facility to act on those desires for most people morality is simply lack of opportunity <laughs> that i am not immoral not because i am such a moral person but because i have not much ability to not much capacity to do immoral things that's why it today is one of the favorite pastimes of people is to bash politicians the politicians are all terrible people well maybe but who knows if we got the kind of power that politicians have can we guarantee that we won't misuse that power so the kind of pressure that come the kind of temptations that come but the challenges that are there so every so it's not that politicians are a separate species particularly evil but they are also part of the human species and we all are vulnerable to evil so the the bad things that happen in life are due to misuse of the facilities that have been given by god so in that sense he is the cause of all causes but not the cause of all effects now of course specifically it's very difficult to know okay when i am facing this distress what exactly caused it what was the wrong thing that i did what was the wrong thing that someone else did what exactly happened 
So, but the important thing is, this first point is, Krishna is the cause of all causes, not the cause of all effects. And that's why we can't hold Krishna responsible for our problems. That, now, does that mean that Krishna is uninvolved or unconcerned about our problems? No, not necessarily. Actually, in this regard, I'll go to the second point now. That for us, more, more important than understanding Krishna precisely is to experience Krishna positively. More important than understanding Krishna precisely. Now, what exactly is Krishna doing over here? It's important, but more important than that is experiencing Krishna positive. So, what does this mean? That Krishna says, what to speak of understanding him? Even understanding the working of karma is very difficult. Gahana karma. So, broadly, we can, we can see Krishna's role in the world as th in the world sufferings primarily in three different ways. One is, he is the cause of the suffering. Second is, he is the comforter amid the suffering. And third is, he is the cure for the suffering. Now, first we consider he is the cause of the suffering. Are there any pastimes where we can see Krishna as the cause of the suffering? In 10th canto pastimes? Sorry? His parents became... Okay, yeah, his parents had to go through a lot of distress. They lost six children, seven in fact, you can say. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Still, we can say that was that was the way things worked. But it's not that Krishna killed all the other children, isn't it? So, you could say that in, by some chain of causality, Krishna is the cause. Mm -hmm. But do we see anywhere Krishna is the direct cause of anyone's suffering? Sorry? He killed Pandra. So yeah, for example, he kills demons. Well, that is Krishna says openly, you know, Vinash Krishna. So that he does that. And I'll talk about demons a little later. But let's talk about any devotee. And everybody's trying to be a devotee. We mentioned gopis. Yes, that's probably the most direct example. Well, Krishna, it's his by his own choice went away. We could even say another festival that just happened recently. Go on then, Puja. So it seems Krishna deliberately planned to humiliate Indra. Isn't it? Because he took away his his yagya, his puja, and then he just seemed to take away his power. So Krishna didn't take away his power. Krishna took away the effectiveness of his power. Is, so, it seems that Krishna is causing the suffering in this case. Now, there are other cases where devotee's suffering is caused by something clearly different from Krishna. Or even something clearly opposite to Krishna. Or someone clearly opposite to Krishna. Can you think of an example of that? Duryodhan causing the suffering of the Pandavas. Or specifically, you can say Draupadi. Anyone else from the Bhagavatam? Prahala, yes. So, Prahlad is here. Here there is Hiranyakashipu and here there is Narasimhadi. Mm -hmm. So, Prahlad's suffering was caused by Hiranyakashipu. Here we see an agent clearly different from, and not just different from, but opposed to, openly opposed to Krishna. Sometimes, the agent of our suffering may not directly be Krishna, but may not be directly opposed to Krishna. It may be someone who is either pious, nominally devoted to Krishna, or sometimes even someone who is actually devoted to Krishna. Can you give an example? Can you think of an example of that? Yagi Brahmana. 
गोपास हेड टू लर्न पर्टिकुलर लेसन मोर दैट दी ब्राह्मण टू लर्न लेसन You could consider other examples. Sorry, Akrura. How? Okay, from the Gopi's perspective, Akrura is a devotee, but he is causing them suffering. Yes, that's a good example. Yeah. No. Vishma's passivity. Yeah, okay, he's he's not an agent there directly, but he's consenting to it in one sense. So I was thinking of something is like say, Shringi causing the suffering of Parikshit. He cursed. Hmm? Now Shringi is not an evil person. See, when bad people do bad things, it's relatively easier to accept it. But when good people do bad things, that is much more difficult to accept. Hmm? So for example. As if we are practicing bhakti, and some materialistic or atheistic person criticizes us, condemns us, and that okay, it's it's painful, it's distressing, but still, yeah, that person has a different value system, and from that person's value system, yeah, they I can do the business. But if you come to a temple and some devotee criticizes us, devotee vehemently criticizes us, condemns us, that is much more difficult. So that is what has happened here, Chitraketu. That uh, Chitraketu here is being cursed by Parvati. So you could put it this way that, if broadly you can put this in like four different categories. If it is some demon or some demoniac person, some materialistic person causing us suffering, it's distressing. But okay, it's somewhat expected. You know, if the cause is just uh, like. non personal in the sense that say we have the case where sometimes there is a pandemic sometimes there is a tsunami sometimes there is natural disaster then also okay it just happens it's okay we deal with it if krishna is the cause of suffering you know we may just that's a little difficult to accept but still it's krishna you know i can't question his actions but if devotees become the cause of our suffering That is the most difficult to do. That is, in fact, you know, this past time we can say is the most relevant for us as devotees, because for all of us we find most of our distress. <coughs> If we consider adhyatmic, adi bhautik, adi devi, among these distresses, the adi bhautik distress that we get, we mostly live in the devotee community. But if not physically in the devotee community, most of our socializing happens in the devotee community. and quite often if we have some quota of adi bhautik karma to come then that will have to come through devotees only <laughs> <laughs> so this is extremely difficult. how can a devotee be like this how can a devotee speak like this sometimes devotees may gossip sometimes the devotees may spread some rumors and you see you know, that becomes extremely difficult to do So now, of course, there are multiple ways in which you can deal with this. But so, so I'm, I'm analyzing this talk about there are multiple. Sometimes we can see Krishna is the cause directly, but in many cases we don't see Krishna as the cause. So for us, the other situation would be Krishna is the comforter amid the suffering. The comforter means we see Prahlad Maharaj. What happened to him was he was absorbed in the remembrance of the Lord. And because of that, Krishna protected. Now I'm using the word comfort in an inclusive sense. He was miraculously protected from suffering also. But for us, even even there's no miraculous intervention. Sometimes we are in great distress, and then we come to the temple and we hear some katha or we take the shri and we participate in kirtan, and suddenly the suffering doesn't seem to trouble us so much. It's like there is cold, but if you put on a comforter, the cold goes down substantially. So that is Krishna as a comforter, 
And we all experience some comfort, some relief from suffering by turning our consciousness to Krishna. So that is the second role of Krishna. Krishna is the comforter. <coughs> and the third is Krishna is the cure of our suffering. Now Krishna can cure our suffering by just miraculously removing the suffering. But Krishna can cure our suffering also by manifesting as Krishna Tatha, which draws our consciousness towards him. Not just temporarily, but permanently by increasing our attraction towards him. And that is the focus of the Bhagavad The Bhagavad focus is Parishit Mahaj was cursed. And there was no miraculous intervention to protect him from the curse itself. But Krishna intervened to absorb his consciousness in transcendence. In him. And that's how when the snake bird Aksha came and bit Parichit Maharaj, he had already left his body. His consciousness already absorbed Krishna. His body burned, but his soul was already liberated. So for all of us, now, I said, I said that more important than understanding Krishna precisely is experiencing Krishna positively. That means if a particular suffering is coming in our life, now is Krishna the cause of the suffering? Well, maybe, maybe not. We don't know. When I say Krishna is not the cause of suffering, because somebody say oh, Krishna is teaching me some lesson through this. Well, yes. That, that there are always lessons to be learned from every situation. Mm. But the point is that is Krishna causing that thing to happen or is it our own mistakes because of which is happening? Is it because of somebody else's misdeed that it is happening? See, when we start seeing Krishna as the cause, then that may make us see Krishna negatively. And if that starts happening, then that is particular to our devotion. Anukulyena Krishna Nushinano. Bhakti is meant to be done favorably toward Krishna. So for us, if we start if we start presuming that Krishna is doing this, this Krishna has been how dare you question it? Well, not necessarily. Everything that happens is not necessarily Krishna's will. It is Krishna's sanction. Krishna is allowing it to happen. But it's not, it's not necessarily that Krishna wants it to happen. Like I mentioned, when Draupadi is being disrobed, it is not that Krishna who is impelling Dushasa to disrobe Draupadi, then Krishna is coming and providing Sari to know. It's not like that. So, some, we may, there are, there are times when a devotee may see Krishna as the cause of suffering. And then immediately Krishna sees, the devotee sees that Krishna is teaching me some lesson through this. Krishna is, because I was not ready to learn this, Krishna is teaching me this. So, that is one way of looking at it. Krishna is the cause of the suffering. Parishit Maharaj in one place says in the Bhagavatam that it is Krishna who has come as this as a snake word. But that is not the only way to look at something. So if we see in the first canto itself, when Parishit Maharaj is talking with the bull and the cow, at that time he asked them, okay, what is the cause of your suffering? Now, at one level, this whole conversation seems absurd. It's even ridiculous. <coughs> the bull and the cow bull says, are you blind? Can't you see this, this wild person is beating us? And you are asking, so what is the cause of your suffering? What kind of perverse person are you? But the bull understands that he is not asking him this physical. Not at, not, not at the immediate level of perception. He's asking you at a deeper level. What is the cause of your suffering? And it is this, it is this question that is addressed by the Buddha. And what is the Dharma's answer? Dharma is the answer. Basically, he says the cause of suffering is unknowable. And when he says that, what is Parijitman's response? Bravo, well done. So here, ignorance is appreciated. Then it's not exactly ignorance is appreciated. What is appreciated is the humility 
that stops one from casting blame on others. Now, it is not that Parishita Maharaj will not hold the whole Kali personified, Kali personified as a mild person. He will hold him responsible, he will punish him. But Parishita is also checking the consciousness of the world. And then he will tell you, you are Dharma. So sometimes a devotee may see the cause of suffering as indeterminate. Indeterminate means that it is not possible for me to determine the cause of suffering. And at that time, the devotee's focus is more on, on turning toward Krishna for comfort and for cure. So that's why I said understanding Krishna's actions precisely is not as important. Is Krishna causing this? Well, who knows? Maybe, maybe not. But is Krishna there for me to comfort me in this situation? Yes. We can turn toward Krishna, we can remember Krishna, and we can experience relief amid the suffering. However, if we see Krishna only as a comforter for our suffering, then we may also run into problems. Because there are times when we may seem to lose taste in bhakti. That means we chant. We just don't experience anything. We come in Kirtan and we just don't feel like dancing. Not only don't we feel like dancing, why is everyone else dancing? When we are unhappy, question, why is everyone so happy? So we just experience a complete emptiness. In the Christian tradition, this is sometimes called the dark night of the soul. The dark night of the soul means what? That the soul doesn't experience the light and warmth of God at all. It is one thing to lose external facilities. We may lose our health, we may lose our wealth, we may lose some, lose a loud one. That's bad enough. But if we start, it seems as if we are losing our inner, our connection with Krishna, our taste for Krishna. That is actually a far greater test. And to pass this test, we need to, in one sense, recalibrate our expectation. That is, Krishna, that Krishna does act as a comforter. But that comfort may not be manifest all the time. And that is not because Krishna in essence is inaccessible, always. That may also be just because our mind is affected by the modes and we can't perceive Krishna. And that's why the focus of the Bhagavad Gita is in the third aspect. That whatever be the distress I am facing right now, Krishna is the ultimate cure. Now, when you talk about Krishna as the cure, also there are two different ways of understanding this. One way Krishna is the cure means I have this problem and this problem immediately go. Well, it doesn't work like that. That is the karma kanda expectation. Uh, devotee's expectation is somewhat different. Your cure means that Krishna will ultimately take me to a place that is free from all suffering. So whatever karma may get me to, Krishna will get me through. So that is a devotee's focus. Parishit Maharaj, it took him seven days. It's about the part of the Sudeva Devaki. It took them several years to have Krishna. And after, even after Krishna came in their life, Krishna went away to Rindavan. But it eventually happened. Was Shila Prabhupada? Prabhupada was, he was in India. I will mention yesterday's class. Again and again, he was experiencing distress in the sense that none of his endeavors were being successful. And Prabhupada writes that the Chaitanya Chaitanya Amrit is my soul is in his uh, letter, his diary that he wrote at the time of his traveling in Jaduta. He says that. That is remembering the instructions of my spiritual master and in Chaitanya Chaitanya that is giving me succor, that is giving me strength. So here, the limbs of bhakti connect us with Krishna and that gives us some comfort. And the cure ultimately is Krishna. The cure can be Krishna can free us from the inner impurities, Krishna can remove the distress and Krishna can ultimately free us from mental existence itself. So for us, when we are practicing bhakti, 
Krishna is the cause, Krishna is the comfort, and Krishna is the cure. We have to see which vision of Krishna is favorable for our devotion. Which vision inspires us to open our heart to Krishna. And we take that vision. And that is why one of the principles of Bhakti Sarang, that is the last point now, right? that devotional intelligence means to seek that explanation which opens our heart to Krishna, not closes our heart to Krishna. The Dhamni Buddhi Yogamda Yenama Upayanti De. Krishna says, that I give you the intelligence by which you can come to me. So for each one of us in every situation, it is important for us. The same situation could have many different explanations. But we need to seek that explanation which is favorable for our devotion, for our service. When Shri Prabhupada was in America, he, after great effort, he had reached America. After great struggle, even danger, he had started getting some following in America. And Prabhupada wanted some support from India. And what happened was just got no support. At that time, the India, India was not so liberalized in terms of economy. So foreign exchange was a trickling. Getting money out of India was very difficult. So the Prabhupada, just by writing letters from America, got, got, got a sponsor for, build, for building a center in America. And Padamat Singhani was ready. But the Indian government was not ready to release the stock exchange, release the so Prabhupada wrote to his godmother. One of his godmothers, he was also quite influential. He had met the president of India. So he said, you please approach the president. Prabhupada directly to the president. And the president gets so many letters. He may not have read it. So he said, you please approach the president and please ask him to release this. And Prabhupada said, his godbrother didn't even bother to reply to it. He wrote again and again, nothing happened. And then one of his God brother's disciple said, Swamiji, I want to come to come to assist you in the rest. And then he then he wrote back and said, Prabhupada, that's welcome. He said, uh, you take the you take the blessing of your master and then you come. He says, You know, no, uh, you know, can I come there first? And then you can inform my Sujya Master I'll come there. So Prabhupada said, No, we don't we shouldn't have to do that. He said that we are all working on the mission of Bhakti Sansa You tell your spiritual master. And then he'll give the six. And he wrote to his spiritual master. He talked to his spiritual master. His spiritual master almost like uh, poisoned his mind. He said that Bhaktivan Swami, he was never actually a part of the body of mission. He's always a very independent, whimsical kind of person. You know, we served Prabhupada, we served, forget Prabhupada, Bhakti Sansa Thakur. We served Prabhupada throughout our life. When Prabhupada was alive, Prabhupada, when Prabhupada was alive, his Abhay Babu hardly even bothered to come to meet Prabhupada. Once a year, you sometimes come and meet Prabhupada. You think he knows Prabhupada's mission better than us. If you want to be physical, go and follow him. And in the way he wrote it, that his disciple in this particular, this Brahmachari, he said, Swamiji, your mission is not bona fide. That's what we wrote to Prabhupada. So now, you know, all of these could have been crushing blows. I wanted Prabhupada see this, Prabhupada could have said, him. Oh, money is not coming, resources are not coming. Maybe Krishna doesn't want to be Christian. But Prabhupada saw it differently. Prabhupada saw it as Krishna wants me to concentrate all my energies on these Western students. So if, if the mission is going to spread, it is without any help from anyone from back home in India. So Prabhupada, it was Krishna. But Prabhupada saw that distress in a way that was favorable for his devotion and favorable for his service. So that is what we need to do. I'll give two examples of this and then we can ask some questions. As devotees, say, with, for example, Vidura. Vidura was severely chastised uh, by Duryodhana. He says, you are an agent of the enemy. Who asked you to come here? Get out of here. You go with nothing except your breath. Oh, this is a grievous insult. Now, Vidura, how would he see this? In, in, now, obviously, it was Duryodhana speaking. 
but Nidra also saw it as Krishna arranging for him so that he would no longer be obliged to fight in the Kurukshetra war on the side of the Kauravas. If he had been there on their side, he would have to fight. So he decided I'm going to fight. And he, got the, he saw that as an opportunity to decide in diamond. But he also saw that he, he saw that Duryodhana was more or less irredeemable, but the Trashtra was still redeemable. And that's why when Vibhishan was rejected by Rama and Vibhishan came on to Ram's side. But when Viduna was rejected by Duryodhan, Vidura did not come out of the Pandavas. They were just a bit neutral under the language. Because eventually he came back and he delivered the Trashtra. If Vidura had gone to the Pandavas side and had been, had been a part of the people who killed Vitrashtra's sons, Vitrashtra would not have been ready to hear from them for such a person. So the point is that we need to, whenever we face distress, whenever we face suffering, it is for us to use our God-given intelligence to seek an explanation that opens our heart to Krishna. That by opening our heart to Krishna, I mean, that helps us to see how we can continue our service to Krishna. That shows us some service opportunity there for us, for Krishna. And with this approach, we, we will find that suffering, rather than being an impediment in our relationship with Krishna, will actually become a catalyst for our relationship with Krishna. And <clears throat> Another example we can consider is actually even more uh, problematic in one sense. He considers Yudhishthir Maharaj. Yudhishthir's case is actually it's described in the Bhagavatam, but it's described much more in the Mahabharata. You see, Yudhishthir Maharaj was afflicted by a sense of guilt that, and he was not ready to become the king. Now, what was his guilt? Generally, people who have a high, high, high level of consciousness, a strong moral sense, we, we may think that a person has a high moral sense, they will never do wrong. But the nature of the world is anybody can slip. But those who have a high moral sense, when they do something wrong, it hurts them extremely. People who have a low moral sense, they do wrong. And it hurts others and they don't even notice it themselves. It's like that. So, when so many people were killed in the war, Yudhishthir felt, was the war really worth it? Now, because of his high moral he said, but this whole thing started because I gambled. And in this war, Drona had planned to kill, uh, Drona had planned to capture me and made the, the Chakrabhyo for that. But I sent Abhimanyu to make a chakra. And Abhimanyu was glad. Just what kind of king am I? What kind of king can I be? No, I lost all the wealth that our family had got. I caused the death of my own nephew. I'm not worth being a king. I just don't want me. So at that time, what? Everybody tried to console him and it didn't work. Even Krishna tried to console him, apparently it didn't work. But then Bhishma spoke. Now what Bhishma spoke brings Acharya to analyze in different ways. But importantly, here what is happening is suffering has come because of one's own actions. Now of course we can say that Yudhishthir may be, not maybe, Yudhishthir is is overestimating the, his role in the problem. It was not he caused the war. It was he caused the war. But still, you can say that he could have stayed in the forest. Why did he leave the kingdom? He could have thought like that. So sometimes, especially for people who have a have a high conscience or a high moral sense, when a problem, when suffering comes because of one's own mistakes, then that can actually be the worst kind of suffering. Because such people, suffering has come, and after that, because of their high moral sense, they will keep beating themselves up. Beating themselves up again and again and again. So it's being aware of our mistakes, having some remorse for our mistakes, all that is good. 
But if we start beating ourselves down, then who is going to beat us? So that has to stop. So at that time, I would say that, okay, uh, now Yudhishthir was not a gambling addict. At that point, he was first pressured into gambling by the instruction of Dhritarashtra through Vidura. And then he was goaded to gamble more and more by Duryodhana, by Duryodhana and Shakuni Arthas. But this does not free him from culpability. Of course, from transcendental perspective, they think it's all Krishna's plan. But from his perspective, even if he is responsible, he's not solely responsible. So those who are uh, those who are is, have low moral conscience, they take very little responsibility for their problems. And those who have very high moral conscience, they may take too much responsibility, too much blame for their own problems. And both can be dangerous. So at that time. When, if we are putting too much blame on others or we are putting too much blame on ourselves. Especially when we are putting too much blame on ourselves. What does Bhishma say? Bhishma says, Asyanu Vihito Raju. And Prabhupada translates this as, everything is within Krishna's plan. It's a, it's a very precise translation. I looked into the original. I got actually the dictaphone recordings of Shri Prabhupada. And so it is Prabhupada doesn't say everything is Krishna's plan, therefore everything is within Krishna's plan. Mm -hmm. What he means by that is Yudhishthira, even if you committed some mistakes, those mistakes are also within Krishna's plan. It's not that Krishna wanted you to commit the mistakes, but they are within Krishna's plan. And Krishna's plan for now, for you now, is to take the responsibility of you. Anatham Pahi Natham Prabhu. Then all the praja is anath right now. People have become orphans. And you need to become their anath. You need to take responsibility. And you play your part in the Lord's plan. So this is where we don't just see Krishna as the cure. But we see Krishna as the cure acting even through us. No matter how unworthy we are. This means as devotees, here you may have committed mistakes and that's why we will be suffering. But we shouldn't be blaming ourselves or speech. We shouldn't be beating ourselves up down for our, our mistakes. If we are doing that, then we are acting as our own enemy. We are, you see, ultimately, Krishna still loves me. Krishna is still with me. And Krishna's plan is still working in my life. And Krishna's plan is, can still work through me. And that's why sometimes we may, if we come to self-conscious, we start becoming so conscious of our faults that we are no longer conscious of Krishna. We see something Amara Jeevan Sada Papir and Bhakti Rathamu saying something like that. But their consciousness is not observed in their own faults. It's not absorbed in their own faults. Their consciousness is absorbed in Krishna. They are talking about their faults so that they can feel the need for Krishna and for more forward to call out Krishna. But sometimes we get so caught in our own mistakes that then we become negatively self-conscious. To so become positively self-conscious is or rather uh, positively in the sense here yeah, and using positive, not in the positive sense. That means I am so great, why do I need Krishna? Okay. I am so bad, what can Krishna do for me? Even Krishna can't help me. So both are dangerous uh, distractions created by our mind. And this situation also means Krishna is still the cure for my suffering. And if I keep practicing one thing, so Dhabi Buddhi Yogam Tam. Okay, yeah, I made some mistakes. But in there are other circumstances also which led to those mistakes leading to esca uh, ex escalated consequences. And I've learned as much as I can, and try to avoid those mistakes. Let me continue practicing bhakti. So for us, that is the most important thing. Where is Krishna in distress? Krishna is with us, within us, helping us go through that distress and grow through that distress. So rather than focusing too much on the cause, whether it is Krishna, whether it is us, whatever it is, we focus on the fact that Krishna is there to help us go through that suffering. And that is what will help us stay Krishna conscious in all situations and thereby tolerate and eventually transcend and suffering.
So in summarize, I spoke today the topic of where is God amid our suffering? Uh, I talked three points. First is Krishna is the cause of all causes, not the cause of all effects. So when specific distresses come in our life, they may be due to our misdeeds, they may be due to our mistakes, obviously, somebody else's mistakes or misdeeds, or a complex combination of all those things. It is not Krishna necessarily who is causing every suffering. It's like the rain is not responsible for the specific vegetation of the ground. The second part I did this is in that more important than understanding Krishna precisely is experiencing Krishna positively. So we could see Krishna as the cause of our suffering, the comfort, our com comforter of our suffering, and our cure of our suffering. So sometimes seeing him as the cause, and then he's like in the last case, Krishna caused that suffering so that Indra will become free from it. So if you can see the cause and see a lesson to be learned from it, and that helps us stay positive toward Krishna, then we can see Krishna as the cause. But if we don't see any lesson to be learned at that time, then no need to see Krishna as the cause. We can say that like, like the bull, I think that the cause of suffering is indeterminate. When you focus on it, Krishna is the comfort. We try to absorb ourselves in Krishna through the through whichever lives of bhakti we feel most connected with Krishna through. And we get comfort amid our suffering. And that complete experience of relief will keep us positively disposed to it. And in some rare occasions, even that comfort may not come. Like the dark night of the soul, when we seem to lose our taste in Krishna. At that time, we need to see Krishna as the cure for us. That although I am not experiencing relief, I am getting purified. I am getting purified, and Krishna will eventually deliver me. My immediate problems may not go away, but the impurities are going to be. Every day that I am practicing bhakti, Krishna is taking me towards the cure. So, the last part then, based on this itself is that we need to use our intelligence to seek an explanation that opens our heart to Krishna, not closes our heart. So, seeing when, when distresses come in our life, Parikh Prabhupada saw, and nobody was ready to help him in India, I saw that as, oh, Krishna wants me to focus entirely on the people in the West. And so, there's a work with them. And Duryodhana insulted Vidura. Vidura saw that as an opportunity to not have to fight Duryodhana's side. When Yudhishthir saw the catastrophe caused by war, Bhishma didn't even see that this is not, this, you are not responsible for this, for what has happened, but you have the opportunity to fix what has happened. Therefore, take on the service of a king. So in this way, in different situations, that we need to use our intelligence to see how Krishna is providing us an opportunity for service in that situation also. And thus, we can stay Krishna conscious and grow toward Krishna in all situations. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Are there questions or comments? Yes, please. Uh, uh, as you said that uh, Krishna is not the cause of effect, but also you see that the Krishna is the supreme orchestrator. Like say for example, um, he has designed the process, like if somebody does the good, good comes out of it. If somebody does bad, bad comes out of it. Uh, but Krishna is a supreme, so supreme controller that he can design the process other way around as well. Like say somebody does the good, uh, the bad just will come out of it. If somebody does the bad, good just will come out of it. So it means that Krishna is the cause of all the effects. However, he is not the cause of, uh, he is not responsible for the action of that soul. And that's why he gives the, uh, give the information to Bhagavad Gita so that the soul can be the informed choice. So it is negating the point that he is, uh, he is not the cause of the effects actually. Okay. So. Krishna could have gone created the cause and effects his causality differently also. So can we say that Krishna is the cause of all effects? Well, here terminology is important. And I say that within the causal system that Krishna has created, that <coughs> that it is 
Krishna is not personally causing our suffering. Or you can say, Krishna is not our enemy who wants us to suffer. That is the key point to understand. When I said Krishna is not the cause, not the cause of all effects. That means the way souls use free will, that free will, the use of the free will is not to is not determined by Krishna. So, just to give uh, now this, this little work of is going on. So, to get to an example, say one batsman is in great form and another batsman is in very poor form. So, that poor form batsman will strike. The batsman hits the ball and the ball goes and uh, other batsman good form hits the ball. And this batsman poor form on the other side. That ball goes and hits the other, bat, other batsman's bat. And the question then goes and hits the stumps. And they are running and this person gets out. Says, this, it was just an accidental way that that person got out. No, sorry, I think you're getting what I'm saying. The non striker sometimes gets out because the ball ricochets from the back to the stumps. So now that is an accident. It is not that that batsman deliberately planned that I'm going to get you out and I do like this. So if the batsman had not hit the shot, that non striker would not have got out. But it is not that the batsman caused the non striker to get out. So similarly, the point I'm making is that. I also mentioned that point that this Krishna is the primary cause. The secondary cause is their capacity to produce effects comes from Krishna. But the specific effects that come from them, they are not determined by Krishna. So, yes, Krishna in that sense, so if you're seeing the capacity to produce effects, that's definitely coming from Krishna. But the specific effects are not. So, it's a choice of that soul. Yeah, that is the choice of that soul. Prabhupada, you were, when, we, when we hear about you know how Prabhupada uh, went through so much of his stresses and he saw you know different plan of Krishna. Um, so when we you know we, we get motivated and inspired, but when actually we go through distresses and stuff ourselves, our intelligence is just absorbed in you know how to get out of the distress. And you know, we can't see Krishna's plan. So, how to practically um, be able to apply that principle in our lives? So, if we are going through distress, we focus on and try to get out of distress, we don't see Krishna's plan over there. Well, I don't think the two are necessarily opposite. We can see our attempts to try to deal with the distress also as being guided by Krishna. My ability to face problems also comes from Krishna. Now say is that Krishna says, Aham Aushini, if I'm sick and I go to a doctor and take the medicine, the curative potency of that medicine comes from Krishna. So it is not that we have to stop looking for immediate solutions in order to think of Krishna. It is that we see that the immediate solutions also have their potency coming from Krishna. So Krishna can help us through many ways. And sometimes it can be through many solutions also. So Krishna consciousness means to see Krishna's role in all of reality. So as devotees, we may not immediately think of Krishna. We think, okay, this, this thing has happened, I have to do this to fix it. Okay, let's do it. Whenever our consciousness goes towards Krishna, I remember it at that time. So it is said we are giving a class. We may be speaking about Krishna. But is it that even while speaking of Krishna, you are always remembering Krishna? Not necessarily. Prabhupada says that when Arjuna was shooting arrows, it was not that Arjuna was back to the city. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. No, Arjuna was busy fighting. He was absorbed fighting a serious business. So, suppose, say, suppose. We have we had some heart attack and we want some heart surgery to heart surgery to be done. Now would we want our heart surgeon to be chanting Hare Krishna when doing surgery, or would we want our heart surgeon to be focused fully on doing the surgery? What do you think? <laughs> Maybe if I want to die, then we have to be chanting Hare Krishna and remember Krishna. But I don't want to die. Right? I want to live. <laughs> so if that heart surgeon is doing their job well. If we if we were that heart surgeon, no, if you can remember Krishna, well and good. But at that time, the heart surgeon should be remembering that my ability to wear surgery is coming from Krishna. And 
I, my life is devoted to Krishna. And therefore, what I am doing over here is also ultimately in a mode of service to Krishna. The Bhagavad Gita talks about Loka Sangraha. Loka Sangraha may well be some question come to Varasi. That each one of us has to do our duty for the maintenance of the world. That means that for us to function in the world, so many things are required. And we don't arrange all those things. There are people who arrange those things. So those arrangements have to be made as a part of our duty in the world. So we can, we can see the duty, just I have to do it because I didn't do another thing. Or you can see this ultimately, the world is maintained by Krishna. And I have to play my part in that. So we don't have to segregate immediate solutions from remembering Krishna. As we keep practicing bhakti, we start seeing more and more that those immediate solutions also work by Krishna's potency. And now the intelligence that helps us to come to immediate solutions also comes from Krishna. So yeah, let's do the needful for dealing with problems. And try to remember Krishna whenever we can. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. One question on that example you gave for Srila Prabhupada that no when he was not getting help from God others. At that stage he thought, okay, maybe Lord wants me to focus on these devotees here. Now that particular thinking in this example that Lord wants me to focus on this and not abandon this project. How does that come? And isn't that coming from Krishna himself saying, okay, do this and not do this? And a person can as well think, okay, let's stop this project and go back. So okay. how does that work? So, Krishna so, Prabhupada was not getting any response from India. Yeah. Thought that let me focus on the Western uh, speakers. So that thought, I could another thought have come then and let's, let's stop this and go back to India. Could that also have come from Krishna? Yeah, possibly. For example, we see that when Prabhupada was trying to start the League of Devotees. At that time, when he saw that it did not much support, so this is let's leave. So we can also see that there are many things that Prabhupada started. Not everything was uh, always successful. Prabhupada started this political party, in God we trust. And Prabhupada started a great fanfare. Some lecture version of Prabhupada says, you know, now we start a political party. Prabhupada says, one advantage of being in politics, in being of, one advantage of being in politics is you can freely criticize other people. <laughs> <laughs> so they started it, but soon what happened was that uh, Brahma stopped talking much about it. So Balvan Prabhu, Prabhupada said, Balvan Prabhu, you can become the president of America. Prabhupada told him. So he said, Prabhupada, I came to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, are you not interested in the political party? Prabhupada said, I'm very interested, but don't ask me for any money. Because <laughs> <laughs> Prabhupada started the political party, but once he realized for campaigning how much funds are required, Prabhupada said that the funds that we have, we would rather use them for than Krishna consciousness. So the point I'm making is uh, that you know, devotee, a devotee does not lose one's individuality while trying to assert Krishna. So Prabhupada tried them some things. And when some things were working, he persisted. Some things were not working, he changed track course. So it was, even though Prabhupada was a pure devotee, it does not mean that every single thing that he did was successful or equally successful or immediately successful. Prabhupada himself says in one of his letters to Sumti Maharaji, now I'm experimenting with various ways to try to introduce Krishna Bhakti to the Western people. So we have to again use our God given intelligence. Yeah, if some service is not working, Maybe that means maybe they may stop the service and do something else. Sometimes it could, but, but the, the difference is a devotee never gives up the desire to serve Krishna. We may give up a particular service to Krishna. When, that's why I said if we become unfavorably disposed toward Krishna, if our heart closes, then what is the point of serving Krishna? We may think, okay, what is the point of doing this particular service? That's okay. If we are all finite beings, and sometimes we may find that a particular service doesn't work so well for us. We may say, I don't want to do this, I should do some other service. 
So there's a difference between service and service attitude. A devotee may give up a service, but a devotee never gives up a service attitude. Any questions? Any questions? I think you have a question. I think I'll go there after the last question. So you were mentioning three different points of how Krishna can be perceived as cause and all the three different points. So in, if you keep all these three points in mind, how do you see the verse of the Bhagavad by Lord Brahma? Where saying see everything, all the distress that coming to you as mostly of Krishna. Okay. So we talk about Krishna is the cause, comforter, and cure for suffering. When when if we how do we see the verse Tattino Kampa in the light of that? So let's look at that verse. Tattino Kampa Susam Shamanu. That it is I see your Anukampa, Susam Shamanu. With, with eyes that are guided. That whatever suffering I'm getting, it's Atmakatam. It is because of my own. But it is you, my dear Lord, you are minimizing that suffering. But the second part of it is Dai Bhak. What is happening over here is that a devotee is maintaining one's relationship with Krishna. It's like, if I stay favorably connected with Krishna, then I stay like a child of Krishna and then I get the inheritance of returning to the spiritual world. So, the verse itself is not implicitly emphasizing or not explicitly, or explicitly emphasizing any particular role for Krishna's mercy. It's saying that that Atmakritam Vipakam, these problems are coming by my problem. This, this, this distress has come by my own misdeeds. But Krishna, you are merciful. So the key point is I stay favorably disposed towards you. So we could say that that's the general, general reading of the Acharyas. Now, within the literal translation of the verse itself, there is no direct correlation between the first and the second line. Right? I see your mercy and I see my problems as coming because of myself. Therefore, I offer my obeisances to you and this way, I will attain you. The four points in that verse. There is a causal connection between the first and second national profile expresses that my sufferings are coming because of my own misdeeds, but you are minimizing those sufferings. So that is a devotee's understanding of that. But the point is, we could also say that we don't know how much our karma is. And sometimes we feel that rather than minimizing my suffering, I did a small mistake and I made so much, into so much trouble because of that. Say, so, why is this happening? So the point is that Krishna, I see your mercy in the fact that in spite of my mistakes and their consequences, I still have the opportunity to be in a relationship. My relationship with you is not lost. And I hold on to that relationship wholeheartedly. So basically, the turning of body, mind, and heart toward Krishna, that is what is required. Now, there is no mention of any particular vision. Is it because Krishna being seen as a cause of suffering? Is Krishna, Krishna is being seen as Krishna's mercy is being seen over there? Is that mercy coming in the form of Krishna and the comfort of Krishna and the cure? I don't think that's mentioned explicitly. So yes, so the, the point is that we take responsibility for the distresses that are coming and we take responsibility also to stay connected with Krishna. Thank you. Yes. When we are, uh, uh, if we see some examples like um, the one in Salted Bread, where we see um, the person who died and gave up his life. Uh, uh, yeah, so the person that gave up his life was reached not by the police officers. And so the Prabhu, that has the author of the book, has said that it was because he has punished so many devotees. So that's how we see it. That you know, he had to go through a very uh, bad death in one sense, 
And at the same time, we see other uh, exalted devotees also suffering. And uh, that also goes on for a long time. But we see that as Krishna's plan, it's only them that can actually handle the situation in, in that way. Does that mean that we are biased or fanatical in the way we look at it um, as compared to you know, Krishna's plan in our own lives, but we are seeing others' lives in such a way? Let me re-articulate the question. So, we're saying, suppose some devotee goes through a very uh, so painful, pain, pain, painful death or painful distress. And that devotee may say that, okay, maybe I have offended other devotees, maybe I have punished others. That's why Krishna is making me go through this. But then we may see sometimes the great souls also going through some sufferings. And the most other devotees won't be able to suffer, endure that. So, how do we see this? Is that your question? Or is that fanatical? Or that's fanatical, fanatical or biased? Krishna. Well, every person has an individual relationship with Krishna. And how Krishna may inspire a particular devotee in a particular relationship, that may vary from person to person. So, rather than thinking of something as fanatical or biased, because he's this is one way Krishna inspires a devotee. So one devotee may get cancer and they will decide, okay, I, you know, I don't want to go through the whole process of struggling to find a cure. I just want to go to the dharma. I want to live over there and I will like, spend my life over there. Other devotee may get cancer and they decide, you know, you know, there's so much more service I want to do. So I, I do whatever it takes to find a cure. And I'll give my service to Krishna. So who is right? Is it that one is more surrendered than other is surrendered? No. Is Krishna can inspire different devotees in different ways? So when we get some suffering, is it because of some, some things, wrong things which we have done? Well, maybe if that kind of analysis helps that devotee to become more humble in relationship with other devotees, I've heard devotees in the past, and therefore I don't, uh, I don't, uh, therefore I shouldn't hurt devotees again, I should be humble. If that makes a devotee practically more, uh, a better, better functioning devotee now, that is good. But when we start looking for causations like that, sometimes that can be quite speculative and even a harmful. I remember one devotee told me that, you know, today I was driving and my car broke down. I know I did chant at it in the morning, that's why Krishna caused my car to break. <laughs> well, really, you know, Krishna is not a vengeful God who is just waiting to punish us for our indiscretions. No, there could be so many other causes why your car broke down. You know? Now, if that makes you chant more attentively, yeah, maybe that's a favorable explanation. But is that an absolute explanation? <laughs> Does that mean that you don't have to service your car? Does that mean that every time you chant a tattoo, you can guarantee that even your car is not serviced, it is going to work forever? Uh, no, it's not like that. So, there is a personal dimension you know, to every devotee's relationship with Krishna. I remember once one, one of our senior leaders was very severely criticized by another leader. And then, as it is, we are, I asked him, why are you not responding to this? Yes, I'm not an animal, I'm not going to defend it. So I was a little taken aback. So that is one attitude. But then, so when other devotees came to the defense from that devotee, he accepted it. Okay, you can do it. But there are other situations that same devotee acted in a different way. He said, you know, somebody, so they were criticizing something else or some other devotees, some other budget. He said, no, we have to respond to this. So we can't really say that how a particular devotee is inspired to serve Krishna or to see Krishna in a particular situation, that is the absolute way for everyone. That may not be absolute even for that devotee. <laughs> Prabhupada, when there are problems in Jhansi, Prabhupada walked away from there. But when there are problems in Juhu, Prabhupada didn't walk away from there. Prabhupada said, if you want to, Prabhupada, you want to return to life and birth. This Mr. and wants to take this land, you have to go over my dead body. So, there are there many different ways in which a devotee may see Krishna in particular situations. 
So what would be fanatical will be if we take the way one devotee sees Krishna and absolutize that everybody has to see Krishna in this way only. That was what will be fanatical. If a devotee sees Krishna in a particular way and that is nourishing their devotion. There's one devotee who I have an editor from Active Body. So one of the editors, one devotee wrote an article about how Prabhupada was so humble. So Prabhupada said we should not walk on grass because the grass is also so. Hmm? And we should not step on the grass. So I said, okay. So is, is it that Prabhupada never walked on grass any time? Well, there are many times that Prabhupada in the morning walks and went to gardens. So he said, no, but Prabhupada said this to me. Okay. Maybe Prabhupada said that. Prabhupada said that for a particular point. So we want to make him conscious that he doesn't know us as well. Be aware of it. But does that, that, that doesn't make it an absolute truth. Mm -hmm. So there could be something which Prabhupada said in a particular incident. And for that devotee, there's a particular lesson over there. So a, a devotee may see Krishna in a particular way. So that devotee wants to like, are you saying that I'm speaking a lie? Say that I'm not saying that you're speaking a lie, but I'm saying that this cannot be a truth that we can publish in back to world magazine, which applies for everyone. So, so we have to, so so this is the individuality of the relationship with Krishna. Or in, and different devotees will perceive Krishna differently. But there is a preference and there is a principle. Or it could be principles and details. They are using preference because they are talking about in terms of nature. The different devotees, based on their nature, may prefer to respond in particular ways. When there are some problems, some devotees may tolerate it a little bit. Other devotees may say, you know, we need to fix this. Let's do this, 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 this. Now, who is right, who is wrong? But it's not a matter of right or wrong. In absolute terms, what is right or wrong for the devotee according to their nature? So, based on one's particular preference, a particular devotee may choose to fix a particular thing, another devotee may choose to just live with it. So, fanaticism is when a matter of preference is made a matter of principle. And you could go to other extreme, like super liberalism is. And a matter of principle is made a matter of preference. So chanting Hare Krishna is a matter of principle. Now whether you sit and chant, or walk and chant, stand and chant, uh, that is a matter of preference. So if somebody starts making that, we attend to one devotee as given class and say, sitting and chanting is Sambhuva, standing and chanting is Rajuva, walking and chanting is Sambhuva. Very interesting. As I asked, what is sitting and sleeping with? <laughs> sitting and sleeping while chanting, what is that? <laughs> so, sometimes we are simplistic animals. Maybe for that devotee, maybe they said that, that, that we will be able to chant better. But that doesn't mean every devotee will be able to chant better while sitting. So it's a matter of difference. Don't make it a matter of principle. Okay. Thank you very much. Grandraj, Shri Bhagavatam Ki. Shri Prabhupada Ki. Gaur Bhakti Ki.